Earthbound is one of those series where every game is its own standalone thing. You know, the events and the characters of one game aren't necessarily a direct continuation of the last. The games do all take place in the same universe, though, and are indirectly linked through the recurring villains, Gygas spanning across the first two titles and Porky spanning across the second two. There's some pretty wide gaps between the games, but that can actually be a pretty good thing. Nothing brings fans together more than speculation and discussion, and leaving untold gaps in the plot gives the fans a lot to talk about. If you're an Earthbound fan, you're probably familiar with Starman.net. Here, Earthbound fans from all across the world will gather to talk about the series, but some fans like to go beyond just talking. Some fans like to express their interpretation of maybe what could have happened between two of the games by creating an entire game of their own. Mother Cognitive Dissonance, an Earthbound fan game created an RPG maker that links the events of Mother, also known as Earthbound Zero or officially as Earthbound Beginnings, and Mother 2, more commonly known as Earthbound. I've covered a lot of fan games in the past, games based on Lisa and Yume Nikki, but I've never tackled something based on a larger property before. I really like fan games based on things already made in RPG Maker because these games often have more cult crowds, and those are the kinds of crowds I find to be the most passionate. That and the fan game in question, being built in the same program, it's gonna play just the same or similarly to the original product. But here we have Earthbound. It might not have been made in a publicly available software, you know, like RPG Maker or Game Maker, obviously, but I find the following for this game is just as passionate as the crowds that come with something like Lisa or Undertale or Yumeniki, and when it had a large influence on the creators of all of those games, it's easy to see why. The creator of the game said it was never planned to be such a huge project, but as time went on, they kept adding more and more and more until it became this gigantic and ambitious fan game. It came out in 2014, I think? That's at least when version 2.0 came out, and I'm pretty sure that is still the latest version of the game you can get. When I first saw this project, it really grabbed my attention. I love the idea of exploring Gygus as a character and seeing why and how he underwent such a brutal transformation into what we saw in Earthbound, and perhaps more directly seeing the story of George and Mary, Nintendo's great-grandparents that raised Gig in the first place. Gig, Gigu, Gigu, Gigu? Gigue? I don't know how to say this. I asked Twitter, and nobody could agree on how to say it, so, uh... Yeah, that's a problem. I'm pretty sure it's Gig, though, so I'm gonna- I'm gonna say Gig. Get- get mad if you want. I don't care. I was really interested in seeing just how faithfully they could recreate Earthbound in RPG Maker, it being as limiting a program as it is, but with that said, why don't we get started? Mother Cognitive Dissonance, Cognitive, Cognitive dis that is really hard to say. This game begins with the classic naming of the characters. I named one of them Frankie and another one Gusto, and I kind of regret doing that because now I can't remember their actual names, so forgive me, but for this review, Alan Navarre is going to be Frankie and Zarbul is going to be Gusto. I'm going to try to remember their actual names, but I can't make any promises. We first find ourselves taking control of Geek himself, only moments after being defeated by Ninten as he retreats into his spaceship. I actually thought this entire entire game was going to be played as Geek, but no, that's just for the prologue. The game truly starts in the shoes of Fr Alinavar, a mook living on the planet Saturn. Um, like a typical RPG Maker game, you're going to be spending much of your time exploring the world, battling enemies, and talking to NPCs, uh, Mr. Saturns to be specific. Uh, apparently Mr. Saturns live on Saturn, which, yeah, I, yeah, I guess that makes sense. I was actually surprised at how accurately they were able to recreate Earthbound's gameplay. It's actually closer to an in-between of Mother and Earthbound really. It's more advanced than Mother, but still more primitive than Earthbound. Enemies exist on the playing field in clear sight instead of the game having random encounters. Um, the battle transitions are there, and the battle screens look like an evolution of Mother's, just not fully evolved into Earthbound yet. You know, it's got the simple black menus of Mother, but also the abstract animated backgrounds of Earthbound. Seeing as the game is meant to be a transition piece between the two titles, it's really interesting that they had the gameplay and visuals represent that as well. But of course, there's plenty of things RPG Maker holds the game back from doing. The enemies don't gravitate towards you as you move in the same way they did in Earthbound. Now, they just kind of walk around the overworld at their own pace. It's really easy just to walk by them, at least until the later parts of the game when they actually somewhat come at you. You also can't walk diagonally, which I'm pretty sure is something you can do in RPG Maker, so I'm not too sure what that's all about. The one thing that got on my nerves the most, though, was the inability to run. Just about every RPG Maker game that isn't a Niki fan game has a sprint button. 
button, but here, you're stuck going about as fast as a turtle. And I know Earthbound didn't have a run button either, but the American version of Mother did, and since they're drawing from both titles, I really don't think it would have been out of place here. Now, while the gameplay hits a sort of middle ground between Mother and Earthbound, the story is structured more closely to that of Mother 3's. Like Mother 3, the game split up into multiple chapters. The first handful of chapters all follow a specific character as they tackle a subplot of their own, before leading up to the inciting moment where they all meet up. The first chapter follows Alanavar as he encounters Geeg and learns just how much of a threat to the universe he is. He's then told by a mysterious being how he and three others will team up to fight Geeg. The hook's there, but man, the rest of this chapter is a slog. When you've only got the one party member, the game really struggles to be that interesting when it comes to battling enemies. This is actually something I kind of had a problem with in Off, but here, oh, it's really bad. Earthbound managed to be somewhat interesting with just the one character for the first bit, so I know it's not impossible, but man, they really didn't do a good job of making the battles here very entertaining with just one guy in your party, and having to walk so slowly everywhere, especially when you're very unsure of where to go, man, I actually almost quit playing out of losing interest. There's a somewhat entertaining subplot halfway through the first chapter about this political struggle between the Mooks and the Mr. Saturns. Some Mook gets in charge, and in spite of all the Mr. Saturn protesters, he banishes the wearing of Saturn ribbons. You even have to dispose of any ribbons in your inventory before entering the town if you don't want to get attacked by the guards. It's a quirky and fun little subplot that really helps the first chapter develop these characters, but what kills it is how slow and boring it actually is to play through. It does get a lot better, though. Chapter 2 starts up with Larice, a starman in line for the chopping block who decides to break out and escape from Geek's ship. It's here that we meet with one of the game's most important characters, Niu a Niu Ni Niu Niu a Okay, great. Another name that's like impossible to pronounce. Why do you do this to me? I'm just gonna call him Niu, I guess. Apologies if that's not right, but yeah, Niu is another alien of the same race as Geek, but sporting long blonde hair, a baseball cap, and a blue shirt. Yeah, uncannily reminiscent of Ninten, isn't it? But there's a reason for that, and you'll see it by the end of the game. Niu explains that ever since his defeat on Earth, Geek has been letting his anger get out of control, putting him on this rampaging warpath that needs to be stopped at all costs. This in mind, Niyu aids Laris' escape. This part of the game has this teleport move that makes navigating the overworld a little bit more interesting, which is something that's desperately needed when playing the game with just one party member, you know? The second half of Chapter 2 follows Zarbul, a little UFO dude who travels into town to play a show at Bowfest, which I'm guessing that's kind of like Woodstock except on Saturn. We also get to play as a character called Colonel Saturn, a military-savvy Mr. Saturn who bumps into Laris and brings him to the Bowfest. It's here that our four heroes meet up and become a team. So, now that you have a complete party, you've got many characters that are all good at different things. So, Al Navar has a good mix of healing and attacking PSI moves. He also has some tentacle whip attacks that are really helpful earlier on in the game. I guess he's mostly comparable to Ness. Uh, Colonel Saturn, on the other hand, is a support character, his moves primarily being all about buffs and debuffs. Larisse is your tank. He's got a handful of really powerful PSI moves, like PK Starstorm, and he also has a lot of health. And finally, Zarbul is a sort of support character, being able to cast Reflect and being able to use bombs and bottle rockets, kind of like how Jeff could. For an RPG Maker game, there's a lot of room for varying strategies, and that makes some of the boss fights pretty dang good. From here on out, the game is much more smooth sailing. You'll take out a number of side villains and discover points of power on your quest to stop Geek. These are similar to the ones you find in Earthbound. There's eight total, and you'll have to find them all to finish the game. Some of them are chapter specific, but if you do miss your chance to get one, you'll be able to revisit it anywhere in the game in Chapter 7 to go back and claim it. Though if you do it this way, you might have to fight a harder version of the boss fight to compensate for the fact that you've got more party members now, and you're also a much higher level. This game opens up quite a bit. The whole game isn't just on Saturn, you'll actually journey to other planets as well, including Jupiter, Mars, and even Earth. To get from planet to planet, you'll pilot a spaceship that you can use to freely explore the solar system. It's really big and kind of overwhelming to navigate, so I do recommend googling a map, but it's really cool to have this kind of freedom. Not every single planet needs to be visited, though, to complete the game like Pluto and Venus, but there is a side quest on these planets that you can do to get an alternate ending. I do think the game could have used a little bit more direction, though. If you're not paying total attention to the dialogue during a cutscene, you can get lost and not know what to do pretty quickly, so having a character on board the ship to remind you of what your next goal is, that could have been a really good idea. And I really wasn't a fan of how much they used the Mr. Saturn font. I mean, it is 
was goofy and wacky and iconic, yeah, but in Earthbound, it was used sparingly. You didn't have a lot of important dialogue in this font because it's a hard font to read, but here, that's exactly the case. There's a lot of important dialogue and it's all hard to read. Really wasn't the best decision. The game's plot is fairly interesting, though. It's a really cool take on what could have happened between the events of Mother and Earthbound, not even just on Earth, but also in other parts of the solar system. The writing definitely isn't really on par with that of the official series, though. Earthbound's a series well known for its curveball humor, and cognitive dissonance is pretty hit and miss with it. Sometimes it's good, others not so much. You know, sometimes a joke will feel like something straight out of Earthbound, other times I feel it falls a little bit flat. And I also find at times the writing can hit a tone that feels very foreign to what you'd expect from Earthbound. Sometimes there's drug reference or language that's a little less subtle than what Earthbound would be comfortable with sharing. Because Earthbound, at face value, is a child-friendly game, but with very mature undertones. And here, the mature undertones at time just feel a little bit too apparent, if that makes sense. Subtlety is key, and that's one thing I think this game could have done a tad better. If you need some examples, the use of the word hell kind of felt a little bit out of place, and having the hippie smoke joints and have dialogue that directly referenced drug use, it's just that, I don't know, like, I get this is a fan game and they can do whatever they want with it, but personally, I would have preferred a tone more uh, consistent with the main games. And with a title like Cognitive Dissonance, there was a point when I was starting to wonder if they actually called it that for any reason outside of, it's a cool sounding title, and I was happy to see that the meaning of the phrase does tie into one of the game's major themes. Uh, for those wondering, Cognitive Dissonance is kind of like having inconsistent thoughts or beliefs, like doing something even though it contradicts what you believe and know. I can't really explain how this is relevant to the story without spoiling it, so I'll leave it up to you guys to discover it yourselves. Um, one more thing I found a little bit hit and miss was the soundtrack. A lot of it is just MIDI versions of songs from Earthbound, and in the MIDI format, a lot of them kind of lose the punch they had, but there are some songs in here that are pretty freaking badass. Wait, that, what? That's freaking, that's Megalovania. What the hell is that? Oh, you know what? That actually was, uh, that was an Earthbound fan thing before it was an Undertale, so that's really not, that's not that out of place here. Another track I really liked was this one. It's, no, no, I've heard this. I, I know I've heard this somewhere before. It's been in something, and I was, uh... Um, I need to make sure, because I'm, I'm positive. I'm positive it's from... Okay, so I, I was right, it's the house theme from Zelda 2, and like, yeah, the, the song itself is fitting for the game and the scene, but like... Why is Zelda 2? Why why are you looking there for music for your mother fan game? That's just so weird. Most of this game's sprites are taken directly from Earthbound. A lot of them are maybe edited or tweaked or recolored a bit too, but there is a fair share of original graphics, including some brand new enemies, and many of them do feel very at home with the Earthbound series. One of my favorite parts of the game is when you get to visit Earth, not just because you get to visit some familiar locations from Earthbound, but also because Mr. Saturn's human disguise. <laughs> <laughs> Mr. Saturn's human disguise is like the stupidest thing, it's so good. Don't expect the game to be as touching or heartwarming as the main series, though. Uh, perhaps that's a silly thing to expect from a fan game. Um, you know what, I think I'm just really spoiled coming off of those fantastic Lisa fan games, but, you know, this game does still have a handful of rather strong moments. Chapter 8 especially, buddy, this is where things get good. We get to see every character's own version of Magikint, but more importantly, we get to visually see the experiences of George and Mary as they raised Geek. Alright, so for those unfamiliar with the backstory of the original Mother game, basically went something like this. So Mary and George were the two great-grandparents of Nintendo. In the early 1900s, they were both abducted by aliens shortly after discovering an alien infant that crash-landed on planet Earth. Of course, that alien baby was none other than Geek, and Mary ended up raising him as her own child on board the alien spaceship. That's why uh, his weakness is the eight melodies, because that's the lullaby she 
would sing to him as he was a baby. But uh, anyway, they ended up living with the aliens for quite a while, but eventually George found and stole this alien technology from them and escaped back to Earth with it. But in the process, Mary ended up getting left behind and she was never seen or heard from ever again. Mother Cognitive Dissonance actually shows us these events unfolding, but in a really cool way that could maybe explain the creation of Magikint and how human beings on Earth first discovered psychic abilities. And it was really freaking cool. Of course, none of this is official, but this is a really interesting take on it, and having this be the reward to getting all the way to the end of the game, it was really fulfilling. You also get to see exactly how Geek became Gygus. You even get to see where Buzz Buzz came from. The events that uh, he's explaining to Ness at the beginning of Earthbound, you get to see those events unfold in this fan game. I'm not going to show any of these parts, of course, because, like, spoilers, I guess? I don't know. You guys got to have some reason to play it yourselves, right? And these parts, I think, are easily the strongest things about this game. To get to these parts, though, you're going to have to invest quite a bit of your time, though. For a fan game, this is pretty lengthy. It took me just over 13 hours to complete the game, making it the longest fan game I've ever played. Except maybe Yumi Tuki. That one can be just, like, infinitely long if you just don't know what you're doing. There's a lot of content here, including multiple endings, some of which tie into Earthbound, and others make it its own thing. And I think it's really cool to explore multiple outcomes like that. You know, ones that fall in line with the vision of Earthbound, and others that fall in line with the vision of this game being a standalone project. This is a really impressive fan game. You know, I was really impressed at how well this game captures the feeling of Earthbound using only RPG Maker. I mean, like, it's not one-to-one. -one. There's some technical limitations in there, of course, but even still, there are some things in this game that are really freaking interesting. Uh, that said, though, the game does sometimes get a little bit held back by some sluggish gameplay and writing that sometimes not all always up to par. One of my biggest problems with this game is how grind heavy it can be at times, this part here especially. It's towards the end of the game, there's this boss that kept destroying me. I had to grind for like an hour to even be able to stand a chance against him. Um, a pro tip for this part, the dude that revives your party and saves your game vanishes after one use and doesn't come back, but if you enter the cave right beside him before he fades all the way out, he'll be there ready to use the next time you go out, and if you have to grind at this point, oh buddy, you're gonna need this. And you know that first chapter as well, like man, I was really not having that much fun during it, but I did start to really enjoy the game once I got past it, so if you do decide to play this game, just know that it does get better. But the one thing I find most admirable about this game is that it speaks more so to the lore of the original Mother, and that is a game I really loved when I played it back in high school. I love the backstory with George and Mary and Magikin, and seeing that all fleshed out was really really rad. So uh, yeah, if you're an Earthbound fan, you've got like maybe nothing to do on weekend, definitely check out this fan game. Uh, I'll have links to download it down in the description below, so if you're looking for it, look down there. I'd especially recommend it to fans of the original Mother, you know, people that really like the story of that game, the events that fold out in that game, but uh, yeah, don't expect anything mind-blowing or groundbreaking from this, but it is a very interesting take on what could have maybe happened in between those two games, but uh, yeah, I think they got it to tie in really nicely too, so go down there, I don't know, check it out.